This video is sponsored by Magellan TV. Stars are the primary building blocks of the universe. They bring light to the darkness, are home to planetary systems, come together to form clusters and sculpt entire galaxies. Along the way, they create the heavy elements needed to build rocky planets and even the life that inhabits them. But stars are far away. Even the closest star to Earth, our Sun, is 150 million kilometers away. That means everything we know about stars, how they are born, what they're made of, how they work, how long they'll live, and how they'll even die, we learn by decoding the information imprinted in starlight. Welcome back to Launchpad. I'm Christian Reddy, your friendly neighborhood astronomer. The universe is home to 10 to the 21st stars. That's sextillion stars. In other words, a billion trillion stars. In fact, there are more stars in the known universe than there are grains of sand on every beach on planet Earth. If you're lucky enough to get away from the city lights on a dark, clear night, you'll see a few of them. But even a cursory look at the stars reveals that they're not all quite the same. Some of them are brighter than others, while others are barely visible at all. And that could mean that the faint ones are farther away, or it could mean that there are some really bright stars that are far away that are just emitting more light. In fact, if you look closely, you'll notice that stars come in different colors. Most appear white, but some of them take on a orange or reddish tint, while others take on like a sapphire blue color. For a long time, this was a mystery because observations were made by eye and recorded by hand, and that made it hard for astronomers to compare their observations. Towards the end of the 19th century, astrophotography became a thing, and that meant that long exposures could record the brightness and positions of stars precisely on photographic plates. Even better, spectroscopy had become a thing. Starlight could be passed through a prism, and their resulting spectra could be recorded on photographic plates. Spectroscopy was a game changer. It allowed astronomers to dissect a star's components remotely and reveal their chemical makeup. A star spectrum is complicated. Its surface is hot and dense, so it emits light at all wavelengths, producing a continuous spectrum. But they're also surrounded by atmospheres of gas. The gas is made of atoms, and the electrons in those atoms absorb some of the star's light at specific wavelengths. For example, hydrogen atoms absorb light at one set of wavelengths, helium at another set, and so on. And this makes for a jumbled mess of overlapping absorption lines all overlaid on top of a continuous spectrum. However, different stars show different patterns in their absorption spectra, and that allowed astronomers a way to compare and classify them for the first time. In the late 19th century, Harvard astronomer Edward Charles Pickering set about cataloging every star in the sky according to their spectra. His students were all men at the time, because in those days women weren't supposed to be doing things like astronomy. The story goes that Pickering students didn't want to sit around classifying spectra all day, so they basically blew him off. Pickering got frustrated, and he eventually proclaimed that his Scottish maid could do a better job than these guys. His maid was a Scottish immigrant named Wilhelmina Fleming, who set about the task of classifying thousands of spectra. To help her with the work, she recruited secretaries at Harvard to create an all-women cadre of human computers. Initially, Fleming classified stars according to the strengths of their hydrogen absorption lines. The stars with the strongest lines were type A, followed by type B with the next strongest set, and so on, all the way down to type O. When Annie Jump Cannon took over the team, she quickly realized the classification system could be simplified. She merged or dropped half of the classifications and rearranged the rest according to the strengths of multiple spectral features. Two decades later, astronomer Cecilia Payne Gabachkin realized that the appearance of the star's spectra were due to their temperatures. So the hottest stars are type O, followed by type B, A, F, G, K, and M. It's not alphabetical, but they didn't want to have to change all of their star catalogs. So Annie Jump Cannon came up with a clever mnemonic to help us remember their order. O oh, be a fine girl or guy, kiss me. A reality about stars is that they come in a broad range of temperatures and therefore don't fit neatly into one spectral type or another. Annie Jump Cannon realized this and therefore expanded her classification system to reflect this reality. For example, our Sun is a G2 type star. That means it's a little bit cooler than a G1 star, but a little bit warmer than a G3 star. Vega, by comparison, is a lot hotter than our Sun, so it's classified as a type A0, while Proxima Centauri is a cool red star of type M5.5. Cecilia Payne-Gabachkin also showed that stars are overwhelmingly made of hydrogen, 
followed by some helium and then trace amounts of other elements. This meant that all stars had something in common, and that could serve as the basis for understanding how they work. And we're going to find out how stars work in a moment. But first, I'd like to thank Magellan TV for sponsoring this video and this channel. Magellan TV is a new kind of streaming service that was developed by filmmakers. Feature genres include space, science, history, and nature. They offer documentary movies and even entire series devoted to a single subject. I really like their documentaries on the birth of planet Earth, the world's most powerful telescopes, and how black holes are formed. New programs are added on a weekly basis and can be watched on your television, laptop, or mobile device. In fact, it's even compatible with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, and iOS. You can even just cast whatever you're watching from your phone directly to your TV, including 4K content, which is available at no additional cost. Magellan TV is a great service, and I highly recommend checking it out. In fact, the first 100 visitors to go to MagellanTV.com slash Launchpad Astronomy will get a one-month free trial offer. I'll have a link in the description below, so make sure you check it out. Ultimately, a star is a sphere of hot gas radiating energy. A star's energy originates in the core. A lot of energy, in fact. So much radiation pours out of the core, it exerts a pressure on the surrounding layers of the star. This pressure is strong enough to hold itself up against the weight of the surrounding layers, preventing the star from collapsing in on itself. This balance between pressure and gravity is called hydrostatic equilibrium, and it's essential to understanding how the star makes energy. And when it comes to understanding how stars produce energy, there is no better example than the one right here at the center of our cosmic neighborhood, our Sun. The Sun is large enough to fit one million Earths inside of it. It weighs in at 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. That's 2 million trillion trillion kilograms. That means the sun is capable of accommodating a lot of fuel. But how is this fuel actually burned? 19th century astronomers were trying to figure out the same thing, and they came up with some 19th century proposals. The breakthrough came in the early 20th century, when Albert Einstein showed there was a relationship between matter and energy. Namely, energy is equal to the mass of matter times the speed of light squared. The speed of light squared is a really big number, so even if you multiply that by a relatively small amount of mass, you still get a lot of energy. But how does matter in a star get converted into energy? To understand that, let's think about how our Sun is constructed. The outer layers of the Sun bear down hard on the core, driving pressures up to 250 billion times the Earth's atmosphere. Temperatures are incredibly high, reaching 15 million Kelvin. At those temperatures, hydrogen atoms are stripped of their electrons and become ionized. Hydrogen nuclei are just protons, and protons carry positive charge. Normally, particles with the same charge want nothing to do with each other. They push each other away via an effect called electric repulsion. But under such intense pressure, hydrogen nuclei are moving so fast that occasionally some of them will collide, producing helium nuclei in a sequence of steps. In the process, some of that mass is converted into gamma ray photons. In other words, mass is converted into pure energy. This is nuclear fusion in a nutshell. But protons have extremely teeny tiny amounts of mass, so not a lot of energy is really produced in each individual reaction. But the Sun converts about 700 million tons of hydrogen into 696 million tons of helium nuclei every second. That means about 4 million tons of hydrogen is ultimately converted into pure energy every second of every day in the Sun's core. That's a lot of energy, enough to power a star. About 34% of the Sun's mass is concentrated in its core, and most of that mass is in the form of hydrogen fuel. That's enough to keep the Sun going for about 10 billion years. This isn't just how the Sun works, this is how all 10 to the 21st stars in the universe work. Stars have different colors and temperatures, and the two properties are closely related. Cool stars radiate mostly at infrared wavelengths, so they appear reddish in color to our eyes. Meanwhile, hot stars radiate most of their energy in the ultraviolet, so they appear blue. Our Sun is somewhere in between these two extremes, and radiates mostly in the middle of the visible part of the spectrum. We can tell a star's temperature by examining its spectrum. 
But if you happen to know the distance to the star, then you can calculate how much energy the star is really giving off. It's a property that we call luminosity. Think of it this way. A spotlight is intrinsically more luminous than a flashlight. But if you move the spotlight far enough away, it'll appear no brighter than the flashlight. That means a star's apparent brightness depends on its distance as well as its true luminosity. We can measure brightness of stars fairly easily, so if we happen to know the star's distance, we can easily calculate its luminosity. A star's luminosity depends on its size and its temperature. If two stars are the same size, the hotter star will be more luminous. If both stars are the same temperature, but one is bigger, the larger star will be more luminous. Stars are spheres, so it has a surface area defined by the square of its radius multiplied by some constants. The amount of energy radiating through a single square meter of its surface every second is proportional to the fourth power of its temperature multiplied by another constant, a quantity we call flux. If we multiply the star's flux over its entire surface area, we get its luminosity. It's such an elegant relationship between luminosity, temperature, and radius that I like to call this the star equation. It's remarkable how much we can tell about a star just by analyzing its starlight. But there are thousands and thousands and thousands of stars out there. How do we even begin to make sense of all of that data? Well, the easiest way to do that is to make some comparisons between different parameters and see if there's any interesting relationships between them. So if we look at a cluster of stars, we can examine each star's spectrum to work out their temperatures. We'll arrange them from hottest to coolest, so the hottest stars go on the left while the coolest stars go on the right. If we know the distance to these stars, we can work out their luminosities as well. We can put the most luminous stars toward the top and the least luminous stars at the bottom. If we repeat these measurements for a few thousand more stars, a very clear pattern emerges. This diagram was first plotted around 1910 by Danish astronomer Enyar Hertzsprung and American astronomer Henry Norris Russell. It's called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram in their honor, and it is easily the most important diagram in all of astronomy. The graph shows three clearly defined groups. Most of the stars in this graph are plotted along a diagonal line called the main sequence. It's really not a sequence at all. It's just a holdover from when astronomers thought that stars started their lives very hot and then gradually cooled down. That's not the case at all, but the name stuck. Our sun is here, roughly in the middle of the main sequence. The main sequence's shape reveals how different stars burn their fuel. The more massive a star is, the harder it squeezes on its core, and therefore the faster it burns its fuel. As a result, it's a higher temperature, and that's part of the reason why they are more luminous. The opposite is true of stars on the other end of the main sequence. They're less massive, so they exert less pressure on their cores and burn their fuel slower. As a result, they're less luminous and cooler than other stars. In the upper right of the diagram are a group of stars that are cooler, but also very luminous. That means they have to be very large in order to have such high luminosities. We call these stars red giants. In the lower left are a group of very hot, yet very low luminosity stars. These are called white dwarfs, and they're about the size of Earth. Since a star's luminosity is related to its size, we can map out regions of common radii on the diagram as well. That means a star of a given temperature or spectral type can have a range of possible radii and luminosities. For example, an A0 type star will have a surface temperature of about 10,000 Kelvin, but it could have a radius anywhere from 5 to 100 times the sun and a corresponding luminosity from 10 to as much as 100,000 times the sun. To help keep track of a star's size within a given spectral type, astronomers assign stars to one of six luminosity classes represented by Roman numerals. The luminosity class gets appended to the star's spectral type, producing an overall spectral classification. For example, a K0 star on the main sequence has a spectral class of K0 Roman numeral 5. It's about 75% the radius and 60% the luminosity of the sun. A K03 red giant is 20 times larger and 100 times more luminous than the Sun. And a K01b red supergiant is 200 solar radii and 40,000 times more luminous than the Sun. But what do all three of these stars have in common? Yep, they all have the same spectral type of K0. They're all the same temperature. Our Sun is a G2 Roman numeral 5 main sequence star. 
Most of the stars on this diagram spend most of their lives on the main sequence fusing hydrogen into helium. But stars don't live forever. Over time, they'll exhaust that supply of hydrogen and helium and then eventually move around on this diagram, becoming red giants and eventually white dwarfs. Or at least most of the stars will become white dwarfs. Some of these more massive stars turn into some other interesting things, and we're going to learn about those in future videos. The Hertzsprung Russell diagram is much more than a simple graph. It's a Rosetta Stone for understanding how stars form, live, and die. And the one property that predetermines all of those factors is the star's mass. The more massive a star is, the larger it tends to be, and the more hydrogen fuel it has in its core. But all that extra mass squeezes that core much harder, causing it to burn hotter and burn through its fuel faster. That means that massive stars don't even live nearly as long as low mass stars. Mass determines everything about a star, but it does raise the question, is there a limit to a star's mass? The short answer is yes, probably. What makes a star a star is its ability to fuse hydrogen into helium in its core, and that requires a minimum amount of mass. The cutoff seems to be around 7% the sun's mass. Objects below this limit can't fuse hydrogen into helium, but they can fuse an isotope of hydrogen called deuterium. These objects occupy a middle ground between the lowest mass star and the most massive planet. We call these objects brown dwarfs, and we're going to be talking about those in an upcoming video as well. The lowest mass star we know of is SCR 185-6357, located 12 light years away in the constellation Pavo. At 0.07 solar masses, it's barely a star at all, with the spectral type of M8.5. The star happens to have a brown dwarf companion, but both objects are so cool they can only be imaged in the infrared, so these colors represent where in the infrared part of the spectrum they radiate the most. As far as the upper end goes, stars are thought to top out at around 150 solar masses, and that's because stars form in huge clouds of molecular hydrogen. As they form, they are very, very luminous, and a massive enough star, radiation pressure would prevent it from accreting any more gas from the collapsing cloud. At least that's the prevailing theory. But in 2010, astronomers discovered a star in the Large Magellanic Cloud called R136A1, weighing in at a colossal 315 solar masses. The star is only about a million years old, which means it's already halfway through its lifetime. Its surface temperature is a mind-melting 53,000 Kelvin and shines with the luminosity of 7 million suns. It's so luminous, radiation pressure rips off its outer layers, blasting material out into space in a fast, stellar wind. That means it probably was 350 solar masses at birth, a very big baby. This stellar behemoth and the O, B, and A type stars make our sun look like a tiny insignificant dwarf star by comparison. But the reality is that our sun is really not all that dwarfy. Massive stars are pretty rare. It turns out the most common type of star that are out there are K and M type red dwarf stars. But red dwarf stars have the superpower of long life, as in trillions of years. I talked about red dwarfs in a previous video, and I'll have a link to that in the description below. I'd like to thank my patrons for helping to make this video and channel possible, as well as a thanks to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video. And if you would like to learn how our sun will eventually meet its demise, well, please make sure you subscribe and ring that notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new videos. Until next time, stay curious, my friends.